Can you see my slides? Yes. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Nabrata, and uh, to have me on this panel and uh, to invite me to speak. So I'm going to be talking about dry eye disease and how to restore the tear film homeostasis. And we do realize that uh, we nowadays are talking more and more about uh, the restoration of the ocular surface because we have got a deeper understanding now of how dry eye proceeds and how what the vicious circle of dry eye disease is. We're all very familiar with this circle. Uh, over the years, this has now become a, a part and parcel of how we have learned our ocular surface. And we do know that uh, there are so many factors, but there are two aspects to, to this, which are the core mechanisms, which is inflammation and hyperosmolarity, and how the tear film instability is impacted not only by intrinsic mechanisms, meibomian or uh, lid conditions, but also a host of other extrinsic factors which one can see as they spin around in this circle. They all interact with each other and they tend to amplify the problem and create apoptosis. So uh, when we talk about protecting against these mechanisms of dry eye disease, the goal of treatment is to reestablish homeostasis and integrity of the ocular system. And this is done by either preventing the patient from entering this vicious circle or promoting his exit from it. One may prevent entry into this circle by addressing certain factors such as systemic disease, contact lens use, and all those other factors uh, that are there like surgeries, lasers, infections, etc. And to promote the exit would involve addressing these central mechanisms such as the instability, inflammation of the lacrimal functional unit, and the tear hyperosmolarity. So I'm going to largely talk about the restoration in this, but the effective management of dry eye disease would depend on the points of emphasis in the vicious cycle, where and when and how to intervene to understand the etiopathogenesis and to break it down into its causation and the levels of the disease severity to differentiate again between uh, what is largely aqueous deficiency and what is largely evaporative dry eye and accommodate those overlaps and then to direct the cause, uh, direct the management at the cause. So we know that dry eye has a chronic immune mediated inflammatory disease and it's dependent largely on T cell activation. And this affects the entire ocular surface and includes the lacrimal glands in that process. So it's a physiological response to the invading pathogens or an antigen in this case. The ocular inflammation due to infection or injury can also result in ocular inflammatory disease and excessive inflammatory responses do damage even the healthy tissues and affect parts of the ocular system which become tender and inflamed. The triggering factors of uh, inflammation are the ocular surface immune homeostasis which is regulated by the CD4 regulatory T cells and which interact with anti-inflammatory factors. And the stress factors may all disturb the finely tuned homeostasis, including environmental challenges and the other factors that I've already enumerated. So the knee increase in tear film osmolarity, which produces a hyperosmotic desiccating environment, leads to an increased mechanical shear stress and innate inflammatory events uh, lead to the chronic stimulation of corneal nerve endings and this also generates a neurogenic in, uh, a response, which leads to the impairment of the ocular surface. So tissue destruction and uh, neurosecretion created by the inflammatory cytokines are the consequences of inflammation in dry eye disease. And this chronic neural damage leads to a reduce, reduction in the reflex tear secretion, a loss of the sensory drive to the lacrimal gland, and a decrease in corneal sensitivity. Altered tear levels of these uh, neuromodulators also clinically correlate with the severity of the dry eye disease. So when there is influx of calcium into the cell, there is a, a, a reaction that happens inside, is binds to calcineurin. There is a nuclear factor which gets dephosphorylated, enters the cell nucleus, and then there is a transcription of genes which is involved in the immune response. So this cytokine activation then leads to glandular destruction. It, it leads to a production of adhesion molecules and retention of inflammatory cells. It leads to promotion of hemoptosis and the cell division and the neurosecretory block disrupts the natural tear film and produces a decrease in the quantity and quality of the tears. When one looks at the timelines of how this uh, process happens, uh, it's broadly, broadly divided into three phases. The immediate phase where there is a stress kinase activation and then follows for the next week by a, a phase of acute epithelial disease, which is largely driven by epithelial derived factors, cytokines, matrix metalloproteinases and chemokines. And then by the end of the seventh or eighth day, 
there is uh, now an influx of what we call the activated T cells, and these then produce the uh, CM, uh, the uh, cell mediated uh, immune response and a chronic ocular surface damage. So over the years, techniques have been developed to diagnose inflammation, to identify and validate the surface inflammatory biomarkers and further understand the me mechanisms and to also look at the clinical efficacy of these anti-inflammatory treatments. So when one talks about the MMP9, which is a proteolytic enzyme produced by the stressed ocular surface cells, it is secreted at the high levels by uh, ocular surface epithelia in patients with dry eye disease. And whenever there is an increase in MMP9, there's a disruption of the corneal epithelial barrier function and corneal surface irregularity, which then perpetuates the tear film instability. So patient symptoms uh, in, in dry eye and uh, is uh, all of these, and these are often exacerbated by conditions that will increase the tear evaporation. And, the, uh, and now, of course, with, in COVID times, it's especially important because we are doing so much more computer use, long reading and television viewing, that all these aspects are being exacerbated. So how to diagnose inflammation? Now the initial patient exam, the in inflammation may not be initially evident and it can be overlooked as, as well, but the lack of response or a partial response to conventional therapeutic approaches may suggest that there is an inflammation. So a thorough medical history, uh, note especially features like uh, systemic conditions like uh, rheumatoid, et cetera, uh, the presence of all these patient symptoms uh, determination of the visual function and the examination of the eyelids and the lid margins, the examination of the face, the lid anatomy, the discharge, the hyperemia, especially presence of rosacea. This will almost invariably mean there is an inflammation of the ocular surface and the order of the diagnostic tests that we run from an OSDI to the examination of the face, the slit lamp exam, uh, non-invasive breakup time and ocular surface staining, the Shermer's test and the inflammatory marker testings uh, is generally done towards the end. Now, the MMP9 uh, is a, has a crucial role in wound healing and inflammation and is instrumental in the pathogenesis of dry eye disease and is shown to be consistently elevated in tears of patients with dry eye. It's a simple test called uh, InflammaDry and it uh, will give us uh, an absolute value uh, of uh, whether there is an adequate amount of MMP9 or not. Um, the that's, that's the best way to actually diagnose inflammation other than the clinical impressions that one might have looking at the various signs and symptoms. So to treat, there are many standard therapies that are there. So patient education, environmental and dietary modifications, the first line of defense always being artificial tears which lubricate the ocular surface, produce some dilution effect, but they do not directly address inflammation. Uh, so patients with moderate to severe dryness should always be considered for uh, anti-inflammatory therapies alongside. So these are the therapies that are available to us. They are topical corticosteroids, uh, a host number of uh, non-glucocorticoid uh, glucocorticoid immunomodulators. Two of them have already been discussed by Nikhil, uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus. Uh, there are other NSAIDs, and now there is the uh, uh, LFA1 antagonists that are there. And then there are inflammatory modulations by systemic and topical antibiotics such as uh, tetracycline and some of the uh, macrolides like erythromycin. So cortical steroids uh, are uh, by far the most potent of these uh, anti-inflammatories and they are effective for short-term treatment and they have been shown to have clinical value in these short-term pulsed therapies and they act on various inflammatory responses and uh, clinically improve the dry eye symptoms in, in many trials but there are issues with their use especially if it's long-term use and uh, if one has to use them then the preference would be on softer or short acting or, uh, or superficially acting steroids like fluoromethylone and lotiprednol. So the focus uh, of the anti-inflammatory uh, aspects is largely on this molecule, which is called cyclosporin. It has immunomolecularly and anti-inflammatory properties. It reduces many markers of inflammation, reduces the elevated osmolarity, has anti-apoptotic effects, it's reported to result in the recovery of reduced uh, goblet cell density, but there are drawbacks as well, and which I will uh, enunciate in the next few slides. So how does this work? So I had shown you this slide earlier of how calcium binds to calcineurin and causes the dephosphorylation of nuclear factor of activated T cells and produces the transcription of genes. Uh, 
So what the cyclosporin does is that it binds to cyclofilin, uh, cyclofilin and does not allow the calcineurin activation. So the T cells are not activated and cannot proliferate. So this is then in effect what we would call immunosuppression. Um, if one looks at uh, certain data or evidences for this, one can see here the baseline uh, number of uh, immune staining for activated T cells in a patient of dry eye disease. And this is what happens after six months. One can see a substantial reduction. One can see that there is a significant reduction in the number of cells which, ex which express these inflammatory markers such as CD11A and HLA-DR. And then there are clinical studies as well. The phase three studies showed significant reduction in corneal staining scores, changes in baseline values uh, from baseline values in Schirmer's, in the vision blur, in the reduction of the amount of artificial tears being used, and an increase in the goblet cell density. There was efficacy also reported in the treatment of MGD, wherein we found that there is a reduction in the number of myvumin gland inclusions in patients who are on CSA compared to the placebo. And this may then expand the possibility of usage uh, of uh, cyclosporin in patients with evaporative dry eye as well. The dry eye symptom score was significantly reduced in patients uh, after cataract surgery when uh, cyclosporin was used in this study by Chung et al. And also after refractive surgery, patients who were treated with cyclosporin saw a decrease in the mean OSDI scores and also provided greater pre predictability of their refractive correction uh, between three and six months after the surgery, rather than with just artificial tears. The efficacy of uh, the use of uh, cyclosporin in contact lens wearers uh, showed some improvement in the OSDI, uh, OSDI scores, but there was no statistical difference between the groups. And uh, there was also no statistical difference between the amount of rewetting drops being used in these patients. Uh, but one, if one sees the ancillary drug use in patients who are on cyclosporin, one can see that with pre-cyclosporin versus post-cyclosporin, there's a substantial reduction in the use of NSAIDs, in the use of antihistamines, in the use of steroids, and even in the, in the use of lubricating agents as compared to uh, what they were using before the start of cyclosporin. So there is a uh, a quite a diverse uh, effect that is there on the ocular surface with the, with the use of cyclosporin. And uh, one can see which are the profiles of the patients who would be best benefiting from these. They would probably be in the middle of the range, which is really the majority of our patients. Those with occasional symptoms can well be controlled by artificial tears. Those with very severe or advanced disease would probably not respond to cyclosporin as well because they don't have much surface functionality of their lacrimal glands. So they would not be the ideal patients to use uh, cyclosporin on, but most of our patients lie in the middle and they were the ones who are likely to be most benefited by cyclosporin. A couple of things which are important to remember about CSA is that the effect is not instant. And if one looks at this chart, one sees that the spy diagram that only 32% started to show some difference in symptoms by the end of the first week, but that expanded to around 73% by the end of the third week and almost 90% by the end of the fifth week. So it does take time for this impact to come. Uh, one, one starts to see, uh, and we all know now that topical steroids, the use of topical steroids to initiate uh, the process of uh, anti-inflammatory control is very useful. And here the results demonstrated that uh, the use of steroids improved the patient tolerance and acceptance of chronic cyclosporin therapy. And so it's probably a good thing to start uh, patients with uh, uh, moderate dry eye on uh, low intensity steroid for uh, two or three weeks till the, cy the cyclosporin starts to take effect. So it's also important to do good patient counseling. And here one can see that the patient education is essential for, for doing these, uh, for having successful treatments. Patients must be informed of the common adverse events and also be told that they will lessen over time. And this helps to allow them to stay uh, true and be compliant with the uh, requirements of using this drop. And then good clinical improvements can be achieved in the vast majority. Tractolimus, again, it has already been discussed, but is very similar to, uh, to cyclosporin and is largely to be used in those who are intolerant to topical cyclosporin for some reason, uh, or where the response to topical cyclosporin is poor. 
omega-3 fatty acids for anti-inflammatory use had uh, really to come uh, with a big bang and they were used very widely. Uh, then with the publication of the DREAM study, uh, they went a little bit into the background. I do still feel that they have a role, especially in, uh, in uh, the evaporative dry eye, because they have a, a wider effect on the way they work with the, uh, with the cytokines and how they are of use in a deficient or an unstable lipid layer. Diphytogras, which is still not available in India, is a small molecule uh, antagonist to LFA1, and it blocks the interaction of this, uh, uh, this ligand, which leads to uh, immunosuppression. And the 5% solution is used uh, as, uh, as a competitive agonist, uh, antagonist to block the binding between LFA1 and ICAM1. And this uh, reduces the adhesion and inhibits the secretion of inflammatory cytokines, and that's how it produces its effect. So in summary, inflammation is one of the four key mechanisms of dry eye disease. The stimulation of inflammatory mediators results in a positive feedback, and the examination of the patient's face, lit lamp exam, etc., helps in the diagnosis of this inflammation. And there's a wealth of therapies that is there, and it is effective at reducing the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. This is the summary of anti-inflammatory therapies that uh, currently exist from cyclosporins, steroids, the tetracyclines, O3FAs, cytokine inhibitors, TNF-alpha inhibitors, artificial tears and secretagogues, but the corticosteroids, tetracyclines and the microlides have some uh, side effects associated with this local use and to address inflammation, cyclosporin should remain our uh, number one uh, product. When we talk about osmolarity, uh, we do realize that uh, these patients who have a normal osmolarity are the ones who don't normally fit into the dry eye group, but Wherever the osmolarity goes up uh, beyond uh, 316 is when we start to call them uh, as hyperosmolar. And uh, spikes in the tear film osmolarity of between 8 and 900 are thought to occur over the central cornea, but there is no possibility of being able to collect a sample there. And so these are the things that we normally use. So osmolarity is extremely important. And this is what it is in an isotonic state. You have a well-hydrated corneal epithelium with a well-hydrated tear film on top. But when this tear film evaporates and becomes more concentrated, it sucks out the water by osmosis from the epithelial tear cells, uh, tear, uh, the epithelial cells which uh, shrink. And uh, as they shrink and get dehydrated, uh, there is a, a regulatory volume compensation that starts to happen. And the tear cell, uh, the epithelial cell starts to break in salts to produce what it calls a regulatory volume uh, adjustment. And this restoration of cell volume uh, is accompanied by the, uh, the ingress of all these active metabolites, such as sodium and potassium and magnesium and chlorides and bicarbonates. And these then decrease the cell function and they cause stress activation and cell damage and death. So this again starts to happen fairly rapidly and then starts to create the cell mediated inflammation as well. But how can this be helped? This can be helped. So if we look at the same animation that I showed you earlier, one can, or the dehydrated cell, can have the option of having a regulatory volume increase by doing what it calls a compatible solute intake. Contact, compatible solutes are essentially osmoprotectants, which can be taken up by the cells, and they bring in water molecules with it to restore the cell volume and stabilize the protein function. So cells protect themselves by either synthesizing or importing solutes. And there are numerous tissues in the, in the body which experience hypertonicity. And all of these tissues have the capacity to either synthesize or import uh, compatible solutes, which are essentially small non-ionic organic compounds that build intracellular osmotic strength without damaging proteins. And osmoprotection is when the cell function is maintained without damage under hypertonic conditions. So these are a, a list of the osmoprotectants or compatible solutes that are available in nature. Uh, they are methylamine, they are polyols, they are amino acids, small carbohydrates, urea. And uh, these compatible solutes are all available in many of the products that are now commercially available. And uh, these are the ones that are uh, being going to be discussed here. So laboratory studies have shown that these compatible solutes do make a difference and one, one sees the ratio of uh, these MAP kinases, which in hypertonic media 
become the ratio of phosphorylation doubles once they are given uh, l carnitine and erythritol in the medium they come back to normal and both these graphs show that uh, one 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 sees a, a condial dehydration model and compares it with uh, a non regulated uh, tear preparation one can see that the dehydration with uh, with no treatment is is much worse than the dehydration with an osmotically regulated tear preparation compared to one that is not osmotically regulated similarly osmoprotectin suppresses the production and activity of mnps induced by the hyperosmolarity in human corneal epithelial cells and if one sees the uh, expression of these uh, uh, these enzymes in various hyperosmolar situations in the presence of l carnitine and erythritol even at 450 milliosmols there wasn't much expression of these enzymes which suggests that there is a suppressive effect of l carnitine and erythritol on mmp production in the clinical evidence too uh, patients who are on these regulated preparations tend to do much better with lower osdi scores and lower number of mean drops being used uh, it can see uh, the difference with switch over trials you find that uh, between 75 and 85% of patients improve comfort as well as improve clinical signs and an improve in a tear breakup time so there's an expanding pool of data that suggests that there is a role of osmoprotectants in patients with dad and this osmoprotective effect depends on how much of the osmoprotectant the cell can take up and for how long it can be retained so osmoprotectants are of various sizes like glycerol and erythritol which are small polyols and can go in and out of the cell very quickly in contrast l carnitine is a slightly larger molecule and will then take longer to go in and will stay in much longer as well so a combination of osmoprotectants with different kinetics may actually work better to increase the overall production in dry eye and several of these amino acids and related compounds may function as long acting intracellular compatible solutes and protein stabilizers as well so the conventional artificial tears only have an impact on the surface they only increase tear retention time and decrease evaporation but they do not have any other impact on the actual cell uh, metabolism or the its morphology. morphology so if one looks at the uh, Uh, the hypotonic solutions with an attempt to restore tear osmolarity they only provide a transient control of tear osmolarity because within a minute or two of using a hypoosmotic agent the uh, osmolarity goes into the hyperosmolar phase so this is not really a very effective tool in terms of using hypotonic uh, lotions so to summarize dry eye produces significant ocular surface damage which is mediated by hyperosmolarity of the tear film and this is a key mechanism in the evolution of the dry eye and the cells that can utilize compatible solutes uh, can then use that as a regulatory mechanism to maintain osmotic balance they can help regulate the osmolar balance and stress restore the tf and osmolarity and uh, uh, thereby improve the health of the homeostasis of the eye so to protect against the mechanisms of dry eye disease again reestablishment of homeostasis integrity is important aim to prevent the patient from entering the vicious circle by preventing the or addressing the additional factors and promote his exit from the vicious circle as well so this is the uh, what i would suggest uh, is we use lid hygiene osmo protection and tear substitutes oral tetracyclines and other antibiotics steroids cyclosporine and omega 3 fatty acids other than the other avoidance and uh, environmental strategies so what number i had written was to have two slides which would tell us about what to do and specific to my talk i created these so the diagnosis of inflammation in our clinical uh, environments is based largely on clinical signs such as hyperemia ocular surface staining uh, if we have uh, an access to inflammatory marker assessment yes then the inf mmp9 can be picked up and the observation of non improvement with conventional treatments would suggest that there is probably an inflammatory mechanism at play the diagnosis of hyperosmolarity is unfortunately only assumed uh, unless one has access to uh, a tear lab or a hyperosmolarity measurement device and the treatments are directed towards the cause and to restore the homeostasis uh, when you address this the anti inflammatory agents the use of osmo protection again with compatible solutes in the eye drops and there to those with a balanced mix of compatible solutes rather than just compatible solutes 
and the avoidance of preservatives. And consider a referral if there is moderate to severe dry eye disease, if for some reason there is non-availability of diagnostics or the non-availability of certain therapeutic modalities such as preservative-free medication or many of these other things that we have or a non-response to con conventional protocols that we normally would employ in treating our patients. So thank you so much for your kind attention and uh, be positive and stay negative.